Chapter Three of Sister Simon's Murder Case by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Three. Lizette, rocking the baby, hummed softly to him. In the shadowy room, seven other babies slept in their cribs. This was her favorite time in the routine of pediatrics. The uproar caused by the departure of parents was long past, and all but the most restless children were settled for the night. Life in general was a very satisfactory proposition. Ted had been nice to her on the boat ride after he had worked off his ire over the sculptor, and they had made a date to go up the river to their favorite picnic spot and cook breakfast. Morning dates were different, and practical. Ted was always being practical. That was why he couldn't understand her phobia about going to Waddy's. The baby grunted, pushing the bottle away. Full up, Butch? Lizette whispered. Okay, we'll cuddle but don't breathe a word of it to Sister Simon. She laid the baby against her shoulder and patted him softly. A student nurse appeared in the doorway. Liz? All right, Jenny, tell Simon I'll be there. She didn't send me. I had to tell you. I got my time off. For the whole festival? Yeah, the whole three days. Sister Pete didn't say a thing. I've got to make up the time, of course. That's what I'm doing now. I should have been off at eleven, but I don't care. I don't care about nothing as long as I can be queen. Hey, don't wake up the kids, Lizette cautioned, but she did it gently. In Jenny's drab life there had been one beautiful cherished honor. Up in the woods last summer in her hometown of Marshlands, population 629, she had been elected Blueberry Queen. Next week, courtesy of Sister Peter, she would return to Marshlands for a brief reign before passing her crown on to the next queen. Jenny doubled down on a chair and hooked her elbow awkwardly over the back. It was easy to imagine Jenny at the age of eighty, with the same tired droop and the same bowed shoulders, for the hard work she had been obliged to do throughout her childhood had made an old woman of her. And she was never really neat. Even in the immaculate pink uniform and white apron, with her long blonde hair netted, she managed to have a tousled air. That she remained in nursing school at all was a tribute to the ability of her classmates to cover up her mistakes. Other classes knitted for the lepers or adopted babies in the Far East as their projects. This one looked out for Jenny. Liz, you don't think it's funny, do you? What's funny? Liz asked, absently, because she was running over the possible blunders Jenny might have made since coming on duty at seven. Probably none. Anybody could tuck the kids in for the night. What do I think is funny, Jen? Me being queen. Of course not. The others do. They think I'm too dumb to catch on. And mostly I am. So how can I help being calm as a cucumber? But I don't know. Jenny twisted around into another awkward attitude, and a forlorn note crept into her voice. It makes me feel like the fun I had being queen. It wasn't really fun at all. And maybe people were laughing at me. But you never laugh, Liz. You're just wonderful to me. I'm always wonderful to my roommates, Lizette said. Jenny's outbursts of devotion were sometimes burdensome. Listen, go rinse this bottle if you want something to do. Is that Randy? Mm-hmm. I don't see why you fed him when I just got through. You just... Oh, Jen, you didn't. Isn't he a ten o'clock feeder? Count ten, Lizette told herself. Take it easy. Evidently Jenny had not looked at the feeding board, and having fed the baby, she hadn't charted it. Two large blunders right there. Liz, if Simon finds out, she'll have me campused. I won't get to the Blueberry Festival. I'll even get kicked clear out of school. If you're kicked out, you'll have plenty of time to be queen, Lizette snapped. And you might give a thought to Randy. After all, he's in here for regulation of his formula. Jenny, by now, was crying into her apron, muttering her contrition. The baby seemed happy. Could it be possible Jenny's mistake can uncover the answer to his finicky appetite? Feed him in two courses instead of one? Are you going to tell Sister Simon? Why shouldn't I? Liz retorted. But at Jenny's wail, she added quickly, All right, I won't. I'll chart it all as one feeding. But for Pete's sake, pay attention to what you're doing, and stop bawling. If Simon sees you like that, she'll want answers. You'll never think up. Do the charting quick, Liz. Well, I'll see. 
Lizette hurrying down the hall to the nurse's station reflected that someone, sometime, should permit retribution to catch up with Jenny. Why not now? Of late she had been more careless than ever. It might do her good to be given a thorough scare on the eve of her great day, since no amount of lecturing seemed to impress her. And the baby, too, might benefit if it were known how he had enjoyed his supper. But when Lizette saw Sister Simon bent wearily over the desk, her pretty, young face drawn with fatigue, the determination left her. The sister was peckishly strict, often a peevish disciplinarian, because she was very little older than the students herself. Yet she would give in to the parents when she should have been firm. Overworked, of course, but that seemed to be the normal state for the nuns in the hospital. She shouldn't even be here close to midnight. The end of a sixteen-hour day, Lizette decided, was no time to present anyone with an incident which called for extreme forbearance. She reached for Randy's chart. Just this once, but never any more, she would cover up for Jenny. The telephone rang. Still writing, the nun lifted the receiver, said, No, with severity, and hung up. Lizette turned the pages of the chart slowly. Why should she think the call had been for her? Ted would know better than to ring the floor, and her family was three hundred miles away. In case of emergency, Sister Simon would let her take a call. It couldn't have been anything of importance, most likely not even for her. Yet the stiffness of the nun's back gave her the uneasy impression of resistance. The little office was so quiet that the electric clock, shifting its minute hand, made quite a small disturbance. Sister Simon frowned hard at the work schedule before her. She was not going to pass the message on to Lizette. She was too busy. People should not call at this hour. She moved her head from side to side, trying to relax. Since she had been a supervisor, she was always tired. If only she could have a short vacation. But in the convent there were few vacations. If you had your shoes on, you carried a full load. And the load today had been heavy. Johnny Phelps' mother, for one thing, demanding a certain crib for her son, and getting it. Sister Paul would never have yielded. But Sister Paul was older. She knew how to handle people. Upsets were always happening on Peds. No use pretending she didn't feel the burden of her youth and inexperience. But it was Mother's wish that sisters be supervisors, wherever possible. And since there were not enough nuns ever to go around, and Sister Simon had passed her registry with a near-perfect mark, and she loved children, it was inevitable that she be made supervisor of pediatrics. The neat writing began to swim. She lifted her face to the open window. Lizette had finished her charting and gone. The warm summer night sent in its sounds. The disharmony of the midway across the river, faint and toy-like, the whistles of the boats, an automobile humming by, and under it all the vast quiet that was the night itself. Life was like that, a medley of annoyances, but with certainty underneath. Never in the least confused as to her religious vocation, she had allowed the human irritations of supervising to beat her down. To keep peace, she had given in to Mrs. Phelps. When an aide had telephoned late that she would be absent from duty, there was no reprimand, although these absences always coincided with some escapade of her worthless husband. One thing after another kept cropping up to break down discipline. Like Evie's call a few minutes ago. Evie knew the rules perfectly well. They were posted right above the switchboard. Thrusting her pen into the red ink, Sister Simon reached for a slip of paper, and with a force to spread the pinpoint, she printed in large letters, Attention! The telephone rang. She took it up, listened, and a flush of annoyance warmed her cheeks. Why do I have to tell you this again, Everine? Visiting hours are over at nine, and you know perfectly well that the students do not receive visitors on duty. I shouldn't be explaining, Sister Simon thought. She cut into Evie's apologetic pleading. Certainly you can tell the woman that. Why not? She dropped the receiver into place. Evie would not have given Sister Paul any argument. With herself, from now on, it would be the same. A rule was a rule, and every single one would be kept. She took up the pen again, carefully recrossing the T's. A dear little person, Evie had said, and something about Diane being out on a date, and so the woman was asking for Lizette. Ambulance just pulled in, Mrs. Pobneski announced, trudging into the chart room. Want to bet we get it? I'd probably lose. That kind of night, huh? Sister Simon nodded and crumpled up the paper, 
for she had absently drawn a villainous face in the letter O. The wad hadn't hit the wastebasket before the phone rang again. Poppy reached for it. We'd better turn down the bed in 32, she said before she answered. I'm going to win the bet. Sister Simon felt herself smiling. Poppy had that effect on people. Her hair was usually stringing out, and her cap had been seen to wear a dash of chocolate for a week. Her slip hung down, and her uniform hiked up in the back. But for dependability and cheer she had no equal. I told ya, she said. Kid hit by a car. I'd better get movin. Sister Simon dropped the red pen. It would be a good deal later that she would remember her irritation at Evie's infringement of the rules, remember and wonder whether she herself had actually measured out for someone the difference between life and death. Everine leaned out of her cubicle as far as the harness on her head would permit. She dared not leave the switchboard because the ambulance was screaming up the alley, but she did look anxiously after the little woman. There was something so very pathetic in the way she had asked so diffidently for Diane, then for Lizette, accepting the discouragement as if she really deserved nothing less. It's right there, Evie urged. The woman glanced back. Her cotton dress was crumbled, but the three roses stood up stoutly against the crown of the hat. Evie's finger poked the air. There, to your right, the light switch is right inside the door. I'll find it, thank you, dear. She did go into the waiting room, but no light came on. The room would not be completely dark, of course, for the archway was wide open. Sit down and wait, Evie had said. Lizette will be down in a little while. A white lie, but what could you do? What a time for Simon to stiffen her backbone. Which was more important, anyway, the darn rules or this little scared woman? The switchboard buzzed, and Evie sat down to answer. Emergency wanted things. It was several minutes before she could peek around her corner again. Still there was no light in the waiting room. Honestly, the poor soul didn't have to sit in the dark. Troubles looked bad enough with a lamp on. Evie lifted the headset carefully off the curls she had made blonde for the summer. She could scoot to the waiting room, turn on a light, give the little woman a reassuring word, which she probably wouldn't believe, in view of everything, and be back inside a minute. But with the headset in her hand, she paused. Up and over the archway which separated the hall from the lobby, a Christmas ivy grew. Even in summer, when the front door opened, there was enough draft between the door and the freight elevator shaft to swing the delicate tendrils. They were swinging now. Evie ran her hand around inside her belt to tuck in her blouse, lifted her bosom, and pulled in her stomach. She was information at night, and she had picked up some nice acquaintances here, particularly young men with mothers in the hospital. A minute went by. No one appeared. Well, then the little woman must have gone out when the ivy swayed. There was another doorway unseen from here, from the waiting room into the lobby. Okay, so she was gone. But the ivy began to swing again gently. Now somebody would have to appear. Two people couldn't go out, one after the other, when there was only one to go in the first place. Yet the hall remained empty. The switchboard buzzed. Mechanically, Evie capped the headset in place. Another buzzer joined the first. Oh, murder, Evie muttered, and flung herself into her chair. First chance she had, she was going to walk down the hall and look in the waiting room. If the woman was gone, fine, she'd forget about her. But there was a flurry of calls, and Evie hadn't a minute to herself. When she heard footsteps beating hurriedly through the hall, she leaned out of her corner. Jenny, hey, you're on peds, aren't you? Jenny, almost by, kept stepping away backward. Yes, it's a little girl. I'm going to the blood bank. Listen, tell Liz to give me a ring right away, will you? Maybe she won't even live. Jen, will you tell Liz? It's real important. Tell her what? But already Jenny was running away. Honestly, Evie told herself bitterly, you'd think the fates were dead against the little woman. It would never do to ring Pease again and ask for Liz. She would have to count on waylaying Jenny on her return. Jenny, however, must have taken the elevator over by emergency, because the only human being to appear within the next ten minutes was a timid man, who asked if it wasn't much too late for him to go up to see his wife. Lizette glanced at her watch as she ran down the stairs. Nearly half past twelve. Call Evie about something, Jenny had said. It's real important. 
Sister Simon was still on the floor, so she didn't want to use the station telephone. The simplest thing was to run down to the switchboard. What does he want in the dead of night? Lizette demanded almost before she was around the corner. Evie looked up from the confession magazine rolled open on her lap. What he? Ted, didn't you tell Jenny? Oh, not him. This woman. But she's gone now. I guess she didn't think it was any use her waiting. What woman, Evie? I don't know. She didn't seem to know you very well. Just your first name. But if she asked for me, not the little woman from the park, with an odd sensation that reminded her of dread, Lizette pictured the small figure hurrying up the stairs to Main Street. Didn't she tell you what she wanted, Ev? No, she was scared about something, though. I sure wish Diane had hit on some other night to take a one o'clock pass. Diane? Was it her aunt? I guess so. Know her? So that's who she was. Come again? Remember that tea the student nurses gave for their parents about three weeks ago? Diane brought her Aunt Danny. She was better dressed that time, but she had the same hat. I knew I'd seen it before. Why didn't I think of it? Did she go upstairs after I went and told her? No, no. I saw her this afternoon. Tell me what she said to you, Ev. Not much. When I said Diane was out on a date, she asked for you. She sure needed somebody. I could see that. So how could I say Simon wouldn't cooperate, for gosh sake? Honest, that nun thinks being a supervisor is saying no all the time. What did she do then? Slammed up the receiver. No, the woman. Oh, well, I said sit in the waiting room for a while, and Liz will be down. I was going to get you, too, if it was the last thing I ever did under this holy roof. And I bet it would have been. I guess maybe she went in there for a minute, but then she left. Did you go look? I didn't have to. The ivy started swinging. You know how it does when the door opens. Lizette started down the hall toward the waiting room. She's gone, Liz, Evie said. But the girl hurried on. The waiting room was empty. She turned into the lobby, which was illuminated only by the patch of light striking in from the hall. The outer door was closed. Opening it wide, she stepped on the doorstep, pushed open the screen, and was outside. The old lamp above the door was bleary, its globe dark with the moss that had fluttered themselves to death inside. The moonlight was almost brighter than the lamp. Leaning on the balustrade, Lizette looked down past the stone steps to the street. The little woman would have had to plunge into the darkness under the oaks, fly along with her leafy prattle surrounding her like enemy whispers. Evie should have told her about the shortcut through the basement, for the nurse's home was almost certain to be her destination. Lizette ran down the stairs to the pavement to look in either direction. Silly, of course. Aunt Danny would never dally here. But now she would be safe in Diane's room, probably sound asleep. Lizette took a long breath of the sweet air. The Nicotiana Sister Joe had planted in close to the building was perfuming the whole night. Against the dark wall, the pale flowers were plainly visible. A few sprigs in a glass of water would do a lot for the nurse's station. The girl started up the rather steep terrace and stopped. Something had been tossed into the shadow of the wall. Something black. She had stopped because the thing was against her foot. She pushed it with her toe. It was light, moving easily. Slowly she bent to touch it. A black straw hat. After a moment she straightened with the hat in her hand. It was an old-fashioned hat, high in the crown. Across the front were three roses. In the moonlight, the roses were gray. End of chapter 3